many rivers to cross, my brother. Once I lived the life of a millionaire. That's beautiful. Spending my money, honey, I didn't care. Was taking my yeah. friends out oh, for yeah. a mighty good time. And oh, I drank that good gin, champagne and wine. But oh, just as soon as my money got low. Oh, yes. And yes, uh, welcome to this edition of Dr. Clark Reports. I'm your host, Dr. Gary Clark, and my guest is my good friend, Deacon John Moore, who is an entertainer, musician. He is involved in oh so many things in, in the music industry. And Deacon John Moore, greetings and welcome, my friend. Thank you for having on your show, Dr. Clark. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm uh, just really thrilled and honored to be a guest on your show. Yes, yes, yes. And you know, uh, you, wear, you wear so many hats with, within the entertainment industry, and one that you have here in our community that I really want you to talk about, which is, I think is also important, that you serve as the president of the local musicians union here. That's um, true. And, uh, and, and you're the first... <laughs> African-American president. Yeah, they call me the Obama of the Union. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And, 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 and you're facing many challenges at the end. Musicians, not just oh. you, but the musicians themselves are musicians facing many challenges. Musicians themselves are challenges. facing many challenges today, such as, you know, the outsourcing of movies and TV soundtracks, internet piracy of copyrighted materials, lowballing of payments to writers, publishers, and musicians of musical works being broadcast on radio and the internet, replacing live theater musicians with virtual orchestras. That means that uh, they just play a tape for the ballet. They want to get rid of the pit musicians and replace them with canned music. This is horrible because it threatens a lot of people's livelihoods. Uh, there's uh, this live streaming. The amount of money, the minuscule payments you get for live streaming of music, it's just tantamount to zero you know? that's, that's amazing it's just, it's just amazing you know how little we get compensated for our music nowadays and the worst thing of all is that uh, the uh, technology technology is brainwashing the general public into believing that music should be free because technology helps to make it possible. You just press a button and boom, here comes all the music for free. So people are going to think, well, hey, we should have to pay, pay. for music. <laughs> it should be free. It's a technological brainwashing of people, you know, that really threatens our livelihoods, you know. Yes, and I and I cannot even imagine you say that even well, to even have the virtual music and, and ballets right. and just have piped in music. Right. <laughs> that is a Amazing, it, it, just to even to think uh, of. Yes, oh, just horrible. You know, uh, you know the 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 way the the business is now, and our musicians face all these challenges every day. You know, they're trying to. Uh, and it uh, yes, I mean, and you're there, right. There's so many things that are happening in today's marketplace that challenge the musicians. You know. Yes, uh, and it takes so long to develop a craft. Yeah. And you work to develop it, and then to right. discover that uh, that it is abused in such a way. Right. And, and, and so, with the union, how do you combat all of those issues? You know, from the screaming of the yes. Of the well, union. we have to go to Congress to fight for this <laughs> stuff. You know, we have to uh, get our uh, lawyers and uh, people to go to Congress and lobby our lobbyists to lobby for uh, musicians' rights. Uh, especially, you know, when it comes to broadcasting now, you know, the uh, radio stations have come to the conclusion that we shouldn't have to compensate people to play their music on the radio anymore. 
Now that's amazing. Again, uh, that, where did <laughs> how did this all come about? You know, it's the gradual erosion of the benefits and uh, that we've gained throughout the years. We want to roll back all of these, and you know. Yes, and it took it, a while. Yes, it for took the, a yes. while for us to get all of these gains, you know. And now the industry wants to roll back all of the good things that we've done, and uh, we have to go to Congress and fight this kind of legislation. Uh, it, it's horrible, you know, the way our musicians are being treated today. You know, take for example, you know all of these free festivals, free music. I mean, it's all well and good, yes. you know. They provide employment for our musicians. Uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, people go to all these free music festivals, they don't want to come out and pay for music at <laughs> night because the restaurants and the clubs <laughs> who are the incubators of the indigenous culture, they're suffering because I mean, everybody's going out to see all this free music, the cheap food and all, and the festivals, and they don't want to come out at night to support, to, to, to support it, live entertainment. Live entertainment, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's amazing. They, yeah. They, I go to the free festival doing... Yeah, I go to it too. <laughs> and then, you, and then uh, I see exactly what you're saying. Yeah. We don't understand that, you know, it's an Unintended consequences yeah. in the sense that you, you, mm -hmm. you these uh, these festivals are provided, right. but then it, from the day to day livelihood, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So how does that affect individuals, the, the young musician uh, who wants to go into that field? Does, does it when they see this taking place? When they see all of this? Uh, when they see the types of challenges that's being confronted right right now? Well, what's sad is that the younger musicians. I can't say get that say. Uh, all of them, you know, but many of them subscribe to the uh, survivalist mentality of musicians. A little something is better than nothing, <laughs> and if I don't do it, and uh, somebody else will, and they're so eager to be heard to get this quote-unquote uh, big record contract, uh, you know, so many gigs are going to be generated from this, and uh, to they're willing to play for tips and exposure. You say, well, you get the exposure you're going to get by playing this. You know, put a tip jar out there and people are going to put money in there. But that's degrading to the professional to turn us into a bunch of spurious mendicants where we have to beg, you know, people for money. This is a professional white-collar job, you know. Yes. You don't see the policeman with a tip jar in front of him. <laughs> Everybody's making money but the musicians, you know. People selling all their crafts and their food and whatever, you know. They're making money, and the musicians, what do we come out there with? Tips and exposure? Come I see on, what you're you know, we can't make a living like that. You know, I can't go to the grocery store on tips and exposure. I, 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 I see. I see exactly yeah. what you're saying. Uh -huh. and, and so, and so these challenges, they're, they're they're not unique to New Orleans, are they? They're not. It's pandemic across the whole United States of America, especially in the major cities. There are newer things coming out, like pay to play. If you want to pay, to uh, you have to actually pay. To uh, get a gig in the club now, you know. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, well, pay it's to not, play. Yes. Pay to play yeah. means that you know, uh, you have to provide the advertisement, and you have to go out there and, and guarantee the club owner that so many people are going to have come in and pay to see you. And and if you don't make the quarter, you gotta come up with the rest of the money. <laughs> so you may as well own the club. <laughs> I mean, that's and amazing. there's some newer trends yes. that are coming out like paying to sit in and jam with the house band, you know. <laughs> if you wanna jam with the house band, well, you have to show the club on a receipt where you spent at least twenty dollars at the bar and he'll put you on a list to sit in with the band. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe uh you might have to come back tomorrow because they got so many people on the list now to play yes. to sit in with the bands. Well, yeah. you know, this I mean, <laughs> <laughs> This is the kind of stuff that are happening today and now there's a plethora of musicians and not enough places to play and uh, the purchasers of music realized what is happening so they pit musicians against each other to see who will play 
for free for the tips or whatever, you know, the money they can generate from the sales of CDs or tips, anything but paying them wages. Well, at what point does talent come in? Does what? Does talent come in? At what point does talent come well, in? Because, yes, because that seems to be more of a political, ec economic, it's yeah. more of a, <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I'll, I'll end this by saying, you know, <laughs> uh, what a club owner told me years ago, he said, a good band is one that packs the house. He said, I don't care what this sound like. As <laughs> <laughs> long as long as they so bring the people in here and spend money. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and, and I, I see exactly what you're saying. But man. usually yes. true talent will win out in the end. You know, there's hope for us out there, you know, because uh, the challenge to musicians now is to build up a fan base. You know, so that when they do play and situations occur where the club will give them the door, well, if you got a fan base, it's to your advantage to take the door because you're going to make more money that way. So you bring your fan base <laughs> you with you. You bring your fan base with you, and uh, <laughs> you can make more money probably, you know, than putting the tip jar out there. Oh, about that yeah. far. Oh, then, you know, tips while, are yeah. like the gravy, you know. <laughs> you know that, that tips are all well and good, you know. I encourage people to have a tip jar, you know, but still, you know, you can't just depend solely on uh, what comes in on the tip jaws, you know. It's like uh, the whole situation has turned around now where the musicians become the entrepreneurs instead of the the club owners and the purchases of music, they are usually traditionally called the entrepreneurs yes. because they take the risk in hiring the talent, you know, to make money. But now the situation is so dire to the musicians are the entrepreneurs now. <laughs> so I, we are the ones who are so taking I, I the see risk. I see precisely what you're saying yeah. is that, that there was one point where the musician could just solely be the musician, but yeah. now the musician has to has to market him or herself. Yeah, we have has to have our own yes. social media. We have to be <laughs> our own agents and managers and produce our own CDs and get out and market them ourselves besides do yes. the music. So. <laughs> and, and that takes away from, <laughs> that from the takes, creativity of the musician. Right, it At does. Least I think yeah. so. Yes. Yeah, uh huh. So it puts you it's, in a whole different mindset. It's a whole different mindset in today's marketplace than what it used to be when I first came up playing music, yes. you know, back in the 50s. Yes. Yeah. Now, because I, I would see that, uh, let's say, musicians by and large, you know, perform and work in the evenings. Yeah. But when you, but yet the entrepreneurship and all of that, it's during the daylight hours. The show must go on. <laughs> so, <laughs> the show must go on. <laughs> so it requires a certain amount of energy and, right. and segmentation of your schedule. Yes, indeed. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, I can see that developing like that, and, and, and I see what you're saying. And so now we find ourselves um, in, in, in a different position in for, for the contemporary musician, entertainer, it has evolved and changed tremendously from tremendously. Over, the, over the decades that and you've been nowadays, involved. And yes. nowadays, we have other forms of entertainment to compete with that we didn't have back in before the technological advances that are happening nowadays. When I came up, you know, we didn't have to compete with big screen uh, TVs at home and the internet and video games and these DJs and, you know, it's just like technology has really displaced a lot of our musicians, you know. Yes, well, tell me this about, and I'm glad you mentioned that because um, I was at a conference a while back, and um, the Cutting Edge, and, mm -hmm. and, and I know you've been a recipient of awards from, from the Cutting Edge Music mm -hmm. and Business Conference here in the city, and at that conference, uh, one of the presenters talked about the fact that that instead of having all of the all of the different instruments they can just get one computer or whatever right. and, and and send that in as opposed to as yeah. opposed to having a trombone playing all right they all use synthesized yes. music uh what brought that to light the most in my estimation was this mo uh television series miami vice you know television used to have these big orchestras to provide the soundtrack right but miami vice came on with the invention of the synthesizers and all that was one guy that programmed all the music with all the synthesizers and computers for the whole television series if that's not technological displacement of musicians you know that kind of was and you know, all the jobs that were knocked out. Many jobs yes. have been displaced, you know, through the uh, 
the synthesized music revolution that happened. Yes, and I can. And I, and I Electronic see. drums. Oh, you can what imagine? You, you just push a button, and you get whatever beat you want. Yeah. <laughs> whatever beat is so desired. But yeah. but again, I want to remind my viewers that I'm Gary Clark, and I'm speaking with my friend Deacon John Moore. And yes, uh, Deacon John Moore, uh, we know that you are a product of the city, a product of the community. But uh, will you please tell my viewing audience, audience the Deacon John Moore story? Yes. Well, I started out as a child. <laughs> like in the model words of Bill Cotton. I started out as a child, and uh, uh, my mother was a musician. Her father was a musician. I came from a musical family. My mother had 13 children, and many of us are musicians. My older sister played viola. My mother played the piano. My grandfather played banjo. I have four brothers who play the guitar in various styles, and uh, I have some singers in the band. You know, currently my niece, who's the brother, uh, I mean the daughter of one of my brothers, uh, sings with the band. And uh, she just finished from music from uh, UNO and is currently the cantor at Mala Della Rosa. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and she sings in the band too, and she also has other projects. She plays the saxophone and the piano, and she plays with some of the brass bands. So she has a, a, a musical career as well. And uh, what, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I came up, you know, during the uh, 40s and 50s, you know, it's in uh, Jump Blues. Jump Blues was the my latest project, you know, about 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I came up uh, under the tutelage of many of the famous guitar players in the city, like Roy Montrell, Papoose Nelson, uh, Justin Adams, and during those days, you know, you could go over to people's houses and they'd show you stuff, you know, that ain't in the books. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I learned, you know, to play by ear, basically. You know, I went down to World Lines and brought myself some oh, music Lines. and taught myself how to read music and, uh, and uh, I began to get calls, you know, from the musicians to make gigs because I started out as a singer. I was in Corpus Christi's Boys Choir, and I was the one of the principal soloists because I had the most, the loudest voice in the <laughs> choir. Well, my mother recognized, you know, my talent at an early age, and she cut my nails under a fig tree because there was an old Creole superstition that said, if you cut a child's nail under the fig tree, he grew up to be a singer, and that's exactly <laughs> what happened. I don't know it's because of that, but anyway, uh, and my mother would put me in talent shows, and she play the piano of course I'd always win <laughs> and, nice. and you know and I started a little band when I was in seventh and eighth grade in elementary school singing in the band and then I realized you know that I could get more gigs if I played an instrument so I always I had some kind of affinity for uh, the guitar because I was a uh, chaperone for my older sisters when they went to high school dances and as soon as I got in the door I went straight to the bandstand to watch the guitar player so I knew right away what I wanted to do and uh, I uh, was like kind of self-taught and uh, and I realized, you know, when I was in high school, that's when I started playing the guitar. I could get more jobs if I could sing and play. That combination, that's <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that combination. <laughs> they jump over 10 singers to get a guy who can sing and play because they only have to pay him once. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I progressed through the years, and uh, I just had uh, a really blessed career because I've been able to support myself entirely by my art my whole life. And I've had, you know, uh, some great opportunities came along. Alan Toussaint discovered me playing guitar in the Dew Drop and invited Dewdrop me. Dew Drop in, yes. That was yeah, I caught, you know, the great heyday of rhythm and blues, and uh, I backed up many of stars, Big Joe Turner, uh, Dionne Warwick, Bo Diddley, Bobby Blue Bland, Ray Charles, B.B. King. I played with many of the greats. I sat in Etta James' lap and sang with her at Tupatina. <laughs> so at had many, uh, I've had uh, many great experiences, and I'm really thankful for having such a blessed career. But I've, I had the, the privilege and honor of playing of many of the classic uh, records that came out of New Orleans during the 60s. I was on Barefoot and Tell It Like It Is, Rule of My Heart, 
hitting on nothing, uh, tainted the truth, mother-in-law, fortune teller, lipstick traces, ride your pony, love of love, uh, land of a thousand dances, something you got, I like it like that. Uh, there's so many hit records I played. The, I was like the ghost guitar player. <laughs> we don't you know. realize the heyday of all of that great music that yeah. came out during that particular all period. That, but, you know, and, I was just fortunate yes. to be in the right place at the right time. Because you know? once you play on a hit record, everybody else wants you. So, you know, I uh, got in, uh, besides Alan Toussaint, I played on a lot of sessions with David Tholomew, Eddie Bo, uh, Wardell Cazell, and Harold Baptiste, uh, when they had uh, uh, the uh, AFO records, and I've played on, you know, artists like Johnny Adams, Eddie Bull, uh, Jesse Hill, Ernie Cato, Irma Thomas, uh, 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 Aaron Neville. I played on a lot of the Aaron Neville big records before Tell It Like It Is, and I played on Tell It Like It Is too. <laughs> so I, I've uh, really. Uh, the only thing I can brag about, because I never had a hit record myself, <laughs> is that I was able to support myself my whole life entirely by music. And, and, and I think one of the best pieces ever is uh, that tribute that was done in Orphan Theater at the Oh, oh yeah, yes, that, that, that was that, really that a fabulous production. DVD to have is so outstanding. Uh, we had the best sound, the best lighting, uh, the best musicians and the best writers, the best Wardell, because I was a ranger conductor. Uh, we had a hand-picked musicians, uh, Hurl and Riley, the famous drummer with went and Marcellus played drums. I mean, we just had a stellar cast of musicians, Henry Butler, Alan Toussaint, Dr. John, uh, man, oh, yes. a 20-piece orchestra. And the production was just oh, so the beautiful. The production was just beautiful. And we won the Surround Sound Award that year. We beat out Led Zeppelin and a lot of the major <laughs> groups that year to, to the Surround Sound Award because uh, I had a producer who didn't mind uh, uh, spending money. And he used his own money. He was like the like the the best producer I've ever worked with. Uh, yes, and you performed with Treme as well. Yeah, well, yeah, I was yes. a, and also in order to make it in business, I just didn't play gigs, you know. <laughs> I played uh, television uh, commercials and bit parts in movies. The last movie I was in was The Last Exorcism Part Two. It was filmed <laughs> in New Orleans, and uh, I've been on many television commercials. You see me on the one now, Follow Your Nola, promote tourism in New Orleans. Yes, and uh, I've been on uh, the famous Capital One commercial. What's in your wallet? <laughs> <laughs> I've been on Miller Beer, Snickers Candy Bar. You know, I have, you know, another career as an actor also, besides being a musician. And uh, I was in the movie Angel Heart, you know. Oh, and I, 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 you oh. know, I've done a lot of things, you know, and I won numerous awards. I played at the White House. I sang for the historic... Uh, inauguration ceremonies of the Governor Jindal, Mayor Mitch Landrew, and uh, I played at the, like I said, I played at the White House. I've, you know, so I've uh, really uh, have a lot to be thankful Precisely. for. I've had a blessed career, you know, as a, as a musician and uh, the, like I say, you know, I don't have a grand here. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you, I, I've never traveled in foreign country and played all these big festivals and big TV shows all over the country. However, you know, I've been on a lot of local TV. I've been on Channel 12 for all these documentaries about New Orleans history and culture. You've seen probably right, seen a always. lot of those growing up in yes. New Orleans, uh, Audubon Park memories, UNO memories. And it's it's, it's talking about memories. What was uh, one, one of your great memories from, dude, from the Dude Drop Day? One of my great memories from the Dew Drop was uh, one night I played at the Dew Drop with my band, and uh, in walks Bobby Blue Bland, Little Junior Parker, <laughs> <laughs> and they came wow. in and sat in with the band. Oh, you know, it's legends. They had a concert. I think they just played a concert at the ILA Auditorium. <laughs> and I was the opening act for them. And they didn't, because the dew drop was like where everybody went, you know, after the concert. Well, it was like uh, the catalyst, you know, for many of the entertainers who came there to hang out, you know. 
Now, I've, I've seen so many great, and Lil Willie Joan, Ray Charles, Bobby Bland, Edda, all those people that came to the do drop. To, yes, you know? and, it, it and this particular great, night, yes. Bobby Dubland and Joe Hinton, famous oh, singer. Joe Hinton. Joe Hinton. Oh, man, yes, Joe yes, Hinton yes. lit up the we place. Go, go, you know? Oh, yes. Joe Hinton <laughs> lit up I'm the place. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and then comes the Lil Junior Parker, Bobby Bland. They came in and sat in with the band. I just felt like I was in heaven that night, you know having all those famous people up there because I was just like a young man in my 20s, you know. Yes. And to be uh, affiliated with major stars like that, you know, it's almost like being in heaven. And, and you know, I've had many great memories throughout the years. You know, I played with Bo Diddley. I was on the stage playing <laughs> with Bo Diddley. <laughs> <laughs> I sat on Etta Jane's lap when I played with her at Tipitina's. We were singing, Something's Wrong With My Baby, Something's Wrong With Me. And I sat on Etta's lap. <laughs> well, how do you compare the New Orleans? What, what is that makes the New Orleans artists so great? When you well, look around. Uh, well, our musicians yes. are unique because of the culture that we uh, were raised in, you know. Our music is a lot different from the rest of the world because our music is syncopated. It's derived from the uh, Caribbean and rhythms from the uh, Caribbean and uh, African-American uh, music that came uh, uh, from Africa. Yes. And then uh, it was just a combination of uh, musical uh, styles and, uh, you know, like, not just African American, you know, we had French, uh, they had French opera in New Orleans. They yes. had, uh, you know, the second line music, the that came out of Evolve, out of Congo Square. All of this, you know, uh, contributes to making New Orleans musicians really special when you compare them, you know, to people in the world. Like, look who's our great ambassador, Satchmo, Wayne yes. Marcellus, and you know, uh, because our music is special, you know. It's a product of the indigenous culture of New Orleans and Louisiana. Well, we have one minute uh, remaining. And tell us your aspiration for the union and what you want to carry the New Orleans music well, scene. Well, uh, my aspirations for the union, I want to serve as a role model for the musicians, you know, uh, because the union can help you in many ways that you probably never thought of, you know. And by being a member, you privy to information that can help you further your career. We have a structured system of pay. Uh, we have many benefits to the organizations like health insurance, life insurance, credit union, uh, free rehearsal hall. Uh, we have um, so oh, that's many. Important. Yes. Yeah, all that stuff is important, you know, when you want to embark on a career as a professional musician. Uh, we have a lot of ethical laws that are, uh, how to treat each other in the competitive workplace. All of this, you know, is inherent in our constitution and bylaws. We have regular meetings to discuss all the issues that come up, you know, in today's marketplace. Uh, we have, you know, uh, jobs that we give out, you know, in the schools and nursing homes through our Musicians Performance Trust Fund. So there are many advantages to being in the oh, yes. union. Oh, yes. I want to thank you for joining me. Always yeah. a pleasure. Always. 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 <laughs> hey, let me go out. This is outstanding. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. But, you know, it's, it's outstanding. Well, not yeah. great. And I want to thank you all for tuning in to Dr. Clark's report. And as always, it's been a pleasure. Tell me how did you do?